uh, conference was about reconciliation. I thought that I would title my presentation Reconciling Technology and Life. And I heard some groans when people were like, oh, this is such a about technology. And I like this quote by Mr. Darwin. It's not the strongest, it's not the smartest species that survive, but it's actually the one that's most adaptable to change. And if I could edit him a little, I would say it's the community that's the most adaptable to change. And I like pairing that with a comic drawing of the soil microbiome. There's a lot of critters in there. Because, as we know, communities that are biodiverse are the ones that are truly resilient because they can react quickly to different shocks. So. Only at the grass-fed exchange do you get a soil guy, a dietitian, an entomologist, a water journalist, a bunch of cow poop enthusiasts, some tech nerds, 30 herd scholars walking onto an army ranger's silver pasture, right? That was yesterday. Ray Archuleta thinks that he's in the middle of a B movie. I think we're at the beginning of like, some Broadway musical. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, what, but, but seriously, I really enjoyed about this conference, because I've been here for four years now. Um, I walked into my first conference as an Asian girl in a sea of cowboy hats in Columbia, Missouri. And everyone took me under their wing. It was really friendly. Russ Conser and his wife made sure to sit next to me at dinner and introduce me to everyone. And so it's been such a joy over the past four years um, to watch it grow into this intellectual polyculture. I give credit to Blaine Hitzfield for coining that term. And these are all photos that I took this week of young people, of women. I'm just really happy to see the herd scholars. And looking at this photo, I see a lot of hope. I see a community. I see resilience. I see us equipping each other with networks and knowledge to be resilient, to be adaptable for whatever nature or politics or whatever the um, climate change throws our way. So, I thought Christine was going to talk about technology. So I didn't bury the lead. My talk is actually not about technology. It's about humans. So I'm going to talk about these four things. What is technology good for anyway, and what is it not good for? How to be more human, uniqueness, and networks. So let's start right at the reconciliation of technology and humans. What is technology good for? What is it not good for? Technologists would claim that technology is good at actually a very limited set of things. If you think about computer algorithms or calculators or even automation in terms of machinery or robotics, technology is generally good for repeating simple, repetitive tasks that are programmed for them quickly and accurately and consistently over and over and over again. A bonus of that is that the calculation that you put into your calculator, the machinery is not supposed to break down that much anyway, and, and it doesn't complain, right? It doesn't ask for a pay raise. So technology is good for the mundane tasks that automate something that you would rather not be doing. Humans are good at very different things. And actually technology is uniquely not suited for tasks like finding creativity and meaning from a set of facts uh, or a surrounding, making decisions and judgment with your gut um, taking into account the holistic context of what is happening and where your goals are. Nurturing, providing care, empathy, all of those things that are human to human relationships, and of course, enjoying life. So I would propose that when you think about technology, don't think about it dragging you along. Think about it helping you do what you don't want to do, what it is good at, and then remember that you are always the most important, valuable part of the system. There's a book I would recommend, actually uh, recommended to me by Byron Palmer, a producer in Petaluma, called The Inevitable. And it's a futurist, Kevin Kelly, that talks about 12 trends that we're going to see in our lifetime with the development of technology. One of the ones I found really interesting was this concept that things are becoming services and that ownership is becoming access. So if you think about this in tangible terms, uh, in my parents' generation, you had to own a car to drive somewhere and you had to put a lot of money into that. Right now we have services that where the car, which is a noun, is becoming a verb. So like water. Uh, the hotel is becoming a service where you stay at an Airbnb instead of a physical room or a house that you built. Um, that's shareable assets, right? Even intangible uh, goods like music. When I was in college, and probably the last of my generation to remember MP3s that you physically had to download from BitTorrent and burn onto a CD, and you owned the MP3, and you were really excited when you got a song that nobody else had. Now, the Herd Fellows probably don't know what I'm talking about, because they all subscribe to Spotify, right? It's a subscription as a service, streaming access. Nobody owns, they own the licensing of it, but what you're selling is actually access 
Same thing with Pasture Map. It is a subscription service. You used to buy software that came mailed to you on a CD-ROM. Now you subscribe and the, it's access to the software. So I find it really interesting to think about this in terms of farms and land and how that might create tangible things that used to be, that you used to have to have a large capital assets uh, becoming access and becoming services. So in terms of farms, you already see contract raisers or a lot of young people who are starting out uh, having portable infrastructure, moving their brand, moving their uh, chicken coops, moving tractors around, uh, as popularized by Joel Salatin, right, infrastructure and their services come mobile and it's not tied to a big barn. Uh, land as well, grazing is a service, right, ecosystems as a service. With that, as things that were formerly tangible and um, locked into one place become flows and it becomes about people and their knowledge, uh, the future becomes more mobile and shareable. And it's more about human knowledge and human ingenuity. So the future, we think, is A, it's connected because you know, you've got these people who are moving around, sharing information with each other and sharing knowledge. It's open, it's sharing, it's learning, and it, it is advantaging the people who are better adapted to learning, adapting, being nimble, being creative, and evolving with the landscapes that they find themselves on. So um, I'd like to use the example of my graphic designer, Jeff, who just bought his first farmstead. He, the, the term graphic designer probably didn't exist 50 years ago. And with the advent of new technologies, entirely new careers have sprung up, even my job application developer, a software entrepreneur. That really didn't make sense 100 years ago, right? So there's entirely new industry. I was trying to think of what regenerative careers of the future might exist that don't exist now at about 1 a.m. last night. And uh, halfway through it, I realized that I already know people who are doing all of these things. So it's already happening. So regenerative, climate-friendly wool aggregation as a service. Um, that's Fiber Shed, Rebecca Burgess. Fire prevention, you know, a mobile rain-making goat service. Uh, that is Brittany Cole Bush, a, she a shepherdess who actually doesn't even own any goats. She buys in and out of the goats, and she is holistically managed, uh, man holistic management trained, and she moves her service and her expertise around for public parks to uh, graze down for uh, fire prevention. Ruminant vineyard interface experts, Piscinus Ranch. You heard yesterday Kelly Mulville is just inventing whole new ways to interact um, livestock with vineyards. Silva Pasture Canopy Builders, I think Morgan Hartman might be in the running for that. Um, and just to put it out there, uh, it is very likely that in the next hundred years that we will no longer be an earthbound uh, human species. Given that Elon Musk and other people are trying really hard to leave this earth, we love this earth, everybody here, um, but I would posit that it is really important for us as a species as we think about regenerating ecosystems to take that mindset to whatever asteroid or Mars or whatever that we colonize next so that we don't export extractive uh, human practices, just exporting it to a different planet. What is not replicable, as, as you can probably see, is the ingenuity part of it, the creative part. So one of the things about you, yourself, your brand, is not replicable. Alan Williams was talking about this just before lunch. Our branding and our marketing and differentiation of what your story is and what your why is, is absolutely not replicable. Dee Dee Boyes and Root Down Farm um, in Pescadero is very different from Lydia Carpenter up in Manitoba. And the, the reason that their customers like to support them has just as much, if not more, about who they are and the connection that they've built with their community as it has to do with the, the fact that their eggs are awesome. The great thing about your brand and your story is you're portable, your knowledge is portable, Brittany Cole Bush is mobile. She just moved from uh, grazing public parks with, uh, with a contract uh, group of uh, her goats that she had up uh, in Northern California to moving straight down to Southern California is now signing contracts with the Forest Service. And she actually did the grazing service first and now she's amassing the resources to do it. Uh, but what she's really selling is her expertise. So I think a lot about this next generation of mobile professional grazers. Ariel Greenwood is another excellent grazer up in Valley Ford near me, and she has been grazing for a pepperwood preserve for the past few years, and now she just moved to a new ranch, and she's applying that eye to a totally new landscape. So when you think about technology enabling that, it should be what the goal of the person is first, what the creative mind wants to to do with the landscape and then supporting what they need to get done. I think about this, 
this mobile group of professional grazers and how they have to learn the landscape without 40 years of experience. So for those of you who haven't seen Pasture Map, it's a grazing and, and landscape management platform. So it has an iPhone app and an Android app and you can draw paddocks wherever you go in the field without cell reception, uh, use your, turns your phone into a GPS and a photo taker, and then you can log your herd moves and plan them out and then you can sync that with everybody else who happens to be working on your team, which that, which really helpful if you didn't inherit this from five generations ago and you don't have um, grandpa's experience about how this land responds, uh, especially as uh, you, you manage multiple properties as a contract raiser, for example, for multiple years. You can always go back and look at the photos. And actually, the photos will stay on that property if you choose to, to pass that land to the next grazer. Um, suddenly, it becomes kind of like augmented reality. Right? You're actually appending knowledge to the landscape and being able to leave that as a legacy to the next land manager who can see the record of what you've done, how the land responded, and make their own decisions and make their own mark on that landscape. Okay, but Alan Williams is not replicable, right? We can't clone him, right? There's only one. Well, let's think about that. So Ben Moore is a producer that I met here. He is uh, one of the managers on uh, Bodoc Farms in Alabama, and he is a protege of Alan Williams's. He uses Pasture Map. He look at. I mean, first of all, look at this. This is to me. This is landscape artistry. This is all him. This is genius, right? This is this is the ingenuity of how you come into the landscape, how you decide you're going to reach your management goals. He's moving. I think 41 cow calf pairs per acre uh, in, in in Alabama in an area where the average stocking rate is one per five acres. So I think that's a 200 time. Uh, multiple of the average stocking rate. It's pretty amazing. He's doing restoration work, just going all in, right? Moving them twice a day. And all of that infra water infrastructure he set up. But he's only been doing this for one and a half years. Amazing. He has the backing of Alan, who, can, who he shares the map with, so that you actually are going out and testing your skills, but you have Alan Williams virtually. Right, looking. So, you, so, you know, it's kind of like having Alan cloned <coughs> next to you because he can get on the phone and talk about the same thing and look at the photos and talk about what he did wrong with, with the water setup. I also think a lot about freeing human time. We talked about automation. Uh, it doesn't all have to be automated. Uh, this, is, this is Joe Morris's team from Morris Grass Fed. We set them up all, uh, they have several different properties that they manage, and Joe's team is often in three different properties at the same time, uh, and now they can look at Joe's plan and they can all align on the plan on their phones without having to go back to headquarters to look at the whiteboard. And it's also a better use of his senior grazing manager's time because he can mark out for the temp staff where the valves are. He doesn't have interns digging for pipeline for six hours at a time on a walkie-talkie. And so what that is, is it's elevating your time to be a higher and better use, right? And I want to talk about branding now because that's on everyone's minds and I really enjoyed uh, Alan's uh, conversation before lunch. I think that this data is not just shareable between producers, but also can add to your brand uniqueness. A lot of consumers are not connected to the land. We talked about falsifications, we talked about how you actually know that the land was local and managed well and what your regenerative practices are. A lot of consumers have no idea when we've shown them, this is how you rotate through the paddocks, you actually have to build paddocks every day. This is um, Nettle Valley Farm that actually shares us this marketing material on their Instagram. That's a story that only you can tell because only you did this ecosystem design. And then, to get even further into the weirdness, I want to talk about recognizing her uniqueness. So I thought about this a bit as a consumer. I, I grew up with food allergies, and that's how I got into regenerative food. I owe a lot to farmers and ranchers in the Bay Area that feed me without, uh, with food that I don't break out in hives uh, eating. I've often thought, because I'm a grazing nerd, when I try Alder Springs Ranch, for, uh, ranch beef versus Marker Guard family grass-fed beef. One is in Snake River Valley, one is, one is on the coast of California. They graze different things, the soils are different, and they taste super different. Why would those be sold as the same product? 
They are very, very different products. And then I've been really inspired talking to people in the southeast, these south poles that are so humidity resilient and heat resilient, and then these red devons at, and, um, at Ridge's place, and then the, the Angus's at Morgan's place that are eating apples. What does that taste like? Probably tastes really different. Um, I don't know. I don't know if they taste different, right? But as a consumer, I'm enthralled by that story. And that story is a marketing story that only you can tell. So I'm now interested in understanding how to help you get consistency in your operation, but also on a broader scale for grass-fed, understanding the variability across the different cattle. Because every one of you is doing a bunch of different experiments on the land, right? So with Pasture Map, you can actually look at the uh, herd average daily gain. Any, we play well with all kinds of other platforms. As long as you have um, an Excel that comes out of any weighing, you can send it to us and we update every single ear tag of every animal and you have a fully individualized traceability for every cow all the way to the farm gate. So my project next year is, okay, you can see how well they're performing if you're doing weighings, um, at least when you weigh in and weigh out and see how the animals have performed and where you graze them. So what management decisions led to that performance? But also, uh, I want to tie that into the slaughterhouse. I want to tie that to carcass weight. I want to tie that to quality. And then trace that all the way back to individual animals to help you improve the quality and consistency, hopefully help your branded programs improve quality and consistency. Everybody makes more money. But I also think there's really interesting things that we can learn now with a network of 8,000 grazers in 38 countries. That's the pasture map community. Um, the question is, what can we learn from each other? What kinds of uh, animals do well in different climactic regions from actual producers' data, and actual management practices? What can we share? What are we comfortable sharing? Uh, four years ago, Russ stood up here and challenged somebody who could do data and technology to build a network insights of soil like mine. So it's been a while, but I'm getting there. Um, so we have pulled in uh, through NRCS grants uh, all of the soil data from USDA Soil Lab. So every ranch on Pasture Map can look at your soil profiles. There's a lot of data in there from USDA just to understand what kinds of soils you have. And, um, and then we're starting to put in your actual soil carbon measurement data if you have it. And then we also pull in rainfall data uh, from NOAA. But that uh, on 8,000 ranches is a pretty interesting research question for some PhD, but we, will, we're just, we want to build the information backbone for you to do that analysis as an industry because I want to kick JBS's ass. So <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I want the technology and the information advantage to be in the regenerative side of history. So that is, that's why we're trying to build the information backbone of a regenerative beef supply chain. Uh, there's other really cool data sets, like I said, open and connected is the way that I think technology needs to progress. So this is Global Forest Watch. It's a free resource that, unfortunately, what you're seeing is global deforestation cover loss from 40 years of satellite data. So it's a really powerful image, right? We're losing a ton of forest cover. Um, there's a couple of people here, Charles Bedigal from Yale School of Forestry and his research partner, that are doing the same thing for range and grasslands globally. Um, that's not quite ready yet, but we're very interested in that data set, and we think that, that should be shared openly with everyone um, and, and partnered with other technology companies like us where we can share that and layer that on with actual management data. So this is an example of what I think about when I think about layering data that are open and connected where the sum of what you can tell is more than the parts. So this is Tomcat Ranch in Pescadero. Um, these screens are, uh, they flew a aerial imaging uh, Cessna with hyperspectral filters on top. And so you're seeing vegetative productivity is the green stuff at that point in time. And then Point Blue Conservation Service did soil carbon samples. We now have a partnership with Point Blue to pull in soil carbon data from 80 ranches in California to create some sort of knowledge sharing network, what Joe Morris likes to call looking over the fence virtually so that somebody who is his neighbor doesn't have to confront him or ask him about it but can see what he's doing. And if he decides to do something more regenerative, that's great. So, and then this is pasture map, which is actual photos of what the outcomes were and where you actually moved, where the rest days are, what kind of carrying capacity, what kind of rest days, how did, how did you manage. Putting that all together is more powerful because suddenly we can actually share what works and what did you do to make it work. Okay, I'm going to end in a couple more slides. 
I'm going to talk about the, the other AI, artificial intelligence. Um, that's a neural network on the right. This is the comic we know and love. This is a, this is a, basically a biological network, right? I'm really interested in the neural network processing world because the first time I saw that, I was like, this looks like a swallow food web. And I wonder if um, technology, as it gets better at uh, coming up with algorithms and processing and finding relationships through neural networks that we didn't know existed, I wonder if it could help us understand the relationships between the many different components, nodes of our ecosystems that we didn't know existed. So I think that's really, really interesting. I don't know if, um, I don't think that the data set is there yet, so we're starting to just build the data backbones so that later on we can apply uh, interesting algorithms to find connections that maybe we didn't know existed. I'm going to skip through a bunch of slides on robotics, but you guys can ask me about them later. But uh, what people always ask, well, we're going to have all this free time. What are we going to do? Um, hopefully by now you realize that that's a joke, right? Humans are great at coming up with creative ways to spend their time. This is uh, Paul Brown and Neil Dennis, my friends. Um, well, you could, go back, you could draw stuff on paper if you wanted to spend free time, but I think that's much more interesting to let technology do some of the grunt work for you and then think about what creative ways um, you could continue to regenerate landscapes. One creative uh, way I want to highlight is Albert Strauss's um, methane digester. I don't know how many of you know Albert Strauss. He's out in, he's the first organic dairy in California, and he basically jerry-rigged a methane digester on top of his manure lagoon. It's a, it's a big tarp. He bought, shipped in a uh, German methane electricity generator and turned his poop into electricity. That then feeds back into his farm. His whole farm is cow poop powered electricity and he actually feeds back electricity into the grid and this year he invented the first cow poop powered electric feed truck and his uh, goal is to eventually be able to fully cow poop power uh, his entire fleet. So that's the kind of cool stuff that you can do. <laughs> um, I'm going to end here on the concept of regenerative work because we as humans, we love to create, we love to work. Let's think about regenerative practices in, in our work as well as the ecosystems we manage. What does it mean to wean yourself off of extractive labor that takes energy away from you? What does it mean to just short stress yourself and not create chronic stress in your life and prioritize recovery? What does it mean to build up caring capacity in your skills and expertise? to deepen your roots in communities like this, create new networked relationships, create a people food web in, a, in addition to a food web and a soil web, fertilize the ground, the soil carbon pathway, the sugars that you do to help each other through these pathways of mycorrhizal fungi. What does it mean to mentor more than you take from the community and create new relationships that spur the entire vigor of the community? So that's the community I want to be in. I think grass-fed exchange is a great example of that kind of community. So thank you.